It's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Lauren Ritterbush, the Professor of Anthropology, Archaeology, and Ethnohistory at KSU. She's a product of the Northern Plains, like I am. She's specifically from Bismarck, North Dakota, where she developed her interest in how people have lived in the grasslands over the millennia. And as a side note, she is in the Bismarck High School Hall of Fame. No small feat. She's particularly interested in the adjustment of cultures to grassland environments and has studied migrant groups in the Great Plains and how their incoming presence influenced people already in the region, which interestingly applies to the Ka, today's topic. Much of her work has focused on indigenous peoples of Kansas over the past 2000 years. On a personal note, I first spoke with Lauren in 2012 when I was a brand new environmental educator at Kansa Prairie, I was interested in incorporating the history of indigenous people into the docent training program. When she asked me, quite logically, how far back do you want to go? <laughs> I was completely flummoxed, clearly not having a clue to the complexity of the issue. Since that time, I've been assisted by Lauren on numerous occasions, particularly when someone finds an arrowhead at Kansa and we have found several, typically around the Kings Creek area. So clearly, Kansa Prairie has been important to native cultures from the name of the site to its obvious use as a past hunting ground. With that, I present Dr. Lauren Ritterbush speaking on the Kansa or the Ka and those who came before. All right, well, thank you very much. Uh, I am embarrassed by the introduction, but <laughs> thank you very much. Uh, I appreciate the opportunity to talk with you and I do hope you, if you have questions that you'll post them in chat. Um, I am going to focus on the Kanza, but I will also touch a little bit on other groups because uh, I hope this will serve as just kind of an introduction to uh, our acknowledgement of uh, these lands that provide us with our sustenance, our home, our data for our careers, uh, that these lands actually have been, you know, uh, the lands of people who survived here, who thrived here for literally thousands and thousands of years. And we are among, you know, just a dot on that timeline of people who have been in this region. Uh, there's a lot to talk about, so I'm going to give just a very basic introduction and also realize I come at this from a very academic perspective and which makes it a little difficult be to really express um, the true feeling of the native peoples for their lands. And our language in English really doesn't convey that either. So just to realize that I'm coming at this from an academic perspective. Uh, with the intent to at least provide a brief introduction to provide the beginnings of some understanding of the peoples who came here before us. And so let me get my screen share started here. And excuse my pause here. All right, uh, I'm hoping everybody can see my screen share. Um, excellent, thank you. Okay, so I'm gonna start with talking about the Kanza or the Ka, and I know you've all heard of them. Uh, the Kanza or the Ka uh, are the people that we recognize as having a shared identity with this part of Can what we now call Kansas for about the last 350 years. Uh, much of what we know uh, as Kansas um, was their place of being for about probably about 17 generations. Today, the Kanza live in many different parts of the world, uh, not just in Kansas. They, uh, their actual headquarters of their tribal headquarters is in Oklahoma. And they have lived there for about 150 years, or that has been their national center for about 150 years. So really today, many of the Kanza relate to that portion of very northern, northeastern uh, Oklahoma. But they also recognize in the area that we now call Kansas, especially the whole eastern half of the state, as their heartland. Uh, for it's there that 
uh, their ancestors resided and continue to reside uh, as they believe that the souls of their ancestors stay with the villages that they were once associated with. So uh, one of the many places that the Kanza have lived in Kansas was right here in Manhattan. Some of you may have heard of uh, archeolog what we now call an archeological site, um, that being the Blue Earth Village. Blue Earth Village was, uh, was the main base of the Kanza from about 1790 to about 1828. We don't know exactly when they first established this as their primary village, um, but probably around 1790. Uh, this was an earth lodge village of some size that was occupied by the entire tribe. Uh, the Ka tribe up until about 1828 uh, lived as a single unit except seasonally during certain parts of the year scattered about. The Blue Earth Village was located between the Blue River and the Kansas River in what would now be Eastern Manhattan in Pottawatomie County, uh, just downstream from the mouth of the Blue River. Uh, the illustration you see on the right is a map that was made about 50 years after the site was abandoned, the village was abandoned. And the earth lodges that there had collapsed and left depressions or rings of earth in the ground. And the historical, Kansas Historical Society hired a man by the name of Robert Stackpole uh, from Manhattan to map that archeological site so that they would have some um, idea of what was at that site and how large it was. And that's, for, that's fortunate for us because most of that site has now been destroyed. Uh, if you drive out on Highway 24 east from Manhattan, you are driving over part of that site and you know that there's a lot of commercial development there. So the majority of that site unfortunately has been developed and the Kansas River has also eroded away a good portion of it. Um, so this is one of the few bits of evidence that we have uh, for that site. But we are extremely fortunate that the Blue Earth Village was occupied at a time when Euro-Americans uh, did occasionally visit the Kanza at their village. And we have one really good record of that from 1819 when uh, a small party of scientists that were part of the Long Expedition, the Long Expedition was going up the Missouri River and they set um, a series of, or a set of uh, scientists to go up the, travel along the Kansas River up to Blue Earth Village. And then they spent about three or four days there in August. Uh, I think they had a rude awakening to the heat of Kansas. Uh, if you ever read their, uh, their expedition, it was very difficult given the heat. But as they stayed at Blue Earth Village, they were able to provide us with some information about who the Kanza were at that time and what their village looked like. And among the scientists was also an artist, actually two artists. One person was hired, uh, Samuel, Samuel Seymour was hired specifically to be an artist on the Long Expedition. And I have not included his illustration here, but he did provide us with an illustration of the interior of one of the earth lodges. Uh, the assistant naturalist to Thomas Say, Thomas Say was the naturalist on that, um, on that expedition, and his assistant was Titian Ramsey Peel. Titian Ramsey Peel is the son, one of the sons of uh, Charles Peel, who was an artist and um, back east, and so he trained, he not only named all his sons after artists, he trained them as artists. So although Titian Peel was on the expedition as a naturalist, he took some time out to do a couple sketches of the Kanza and importantly of a portion of Blue Earth Village. So Blue Earth Village, you can see here um, what these earth lodges would have looked like in 1819. They consist of a pole or wooden framework over which 
um, willows or branches were kind of interwoven and then covered with mats and then soil or sediments and grass. And so you have these dome shaped or hemispherical lodges with the entrances as you see here. Uh, these are just a few. As you can see from the Stackpole map, the circles are for the most part, the larger circles are uh, the collapsed remains of earth lodges. Um, the long expedition recorded about 120 lodges and that is roughly, we may have a few more of that than that on the Stackpole map. So imagine a village, about 120 of these earth lodges. They probably ranged from about 15 feet to 30 feet in diameter. Um, they would have been well insulated for both the winter and the summer heat, probably most importantly, the summer heat, because that's when they spent more of their time at the village. Um, each lodge held an extended family, so you could have about 10 people in the lodge, which means we're looking at a population of the Kanza tribe in 1819 of about 1,200 people. Uh, other estimates from about that time period uh, tend to estimate a little bit higher than that. So we may have uh, slightly higher than 1,200. Other things you might notice in this uh, is the horses in the background. They certainly had horses by this time. Those were important, especially for the bison hunting and for they were very mobile people. So they moved around quite a bit. And so the horses were important for that. Even though they lived along rivers, they did not use canoes. They were traveled overland. Uh, you might also notice in the far left of Titian Ramsey Peel's illustration, a person standing on top of the earth lodge. These were sturdy structures uh, and people hung out on top of those. So you get a great view over the bottomlands of the Blue and the Kansas River Valley. And you might also notice, of course, we're only on the edge of the village here, so you can only see what do we've got about half a dozen lodges. And it looks like Titian was probably sitting on top of a lodge also uh, so that he could see out over the village. And you might notice the trees in the background and then the hills beyond that. And if you're familiar with this area, which I assume most of you are, you might imagine that those that you're either looking at the trees along the Kansas River to the south, and those may be the hills in the background with the off to the left, the hill on the left has a little knob on top of it. That could be Fremont Mound, which was an artificially constructed mound built about 2000 years before the Kanza or about 1500 years before the Kanza or and I have yet to determine this, this may be a view, instead of looking south from the village, it may be a view looking to the north northwest. And those trees along the Blue River, and that mound on top of the leftmost hill, maybe a top Bluemont Hill. Um, I assume most of you are familiar with Bluemont Hill, that's the hill in Manhattan that has the word Manhattan across it. And again, about 1500 years ago, a group of people uh, tended to, that lived in this area, built um, mounds on top of the bluffs overlooking the valley. And these were built as memorials uh, to their ancestors and their ancestors were buried within those. So this is probably one of these burial mounds from much earlier. Uh, unfortunately, that the burial mound that was on top of Bluemont Hill was destroyed in the late 1800s when the first uh, water tower was built in, uh, for the city of Manhattan. So here you get a little bit of a sense of the Kanza uh, village and you can see some of their activities, what it might have been like a little bit uh, to be living right here with the area that we're so familiar with today. But what was their life like? Uh, while they were living at the village, they were farmers primarily, although they would be hunting too. Um, as I mentioned before, they were very mobile and 
So the village, although it was a very substantial village, was not the place where they spent the year round. In fact, they spent probably less than half of the year in the village. In April and May, they would be in the village and they would be planting their gardens. Uh, among the crops that they grew were corn, beans, squash, sunflowers, and melons. And melons were a fa fairly recent introduction to them. Uh, corn, beans, squash, uh, and then especially sunflowers had been used much longer um, uh, prior to the Kanza being here. Once their uh, plants, their gardens were planted and they started to germinate, the entire village packed up. This is where their horses were helpful, as well as dogs. Uh, they would pack up uh, their goods and they would move out onto the plains. They would go west from here and southwest from here. And they would spend much of the summer uh, enjoying the prairies. Uh, we have historic records from a little later than Blue Earth about the Kanza going on some of their last uh, summer bison hunts. And these were the most enjoyable times of their year where they would be moving through the plains and hunting bison in large numbers. Of course, for their meat, but also for their hides and the bones that they were using for tools and other things. By early to mid-August, they would start to come back to their village to finish processing the hides, as well as to start harvesting their crops. Uh, so this would be the time of uh, much uh, feasting, uh, celebrating, uh, as they had lots of garden produce and, of course, meat. Uh, the long expedition uh, scientist who stopped at the Blue Earth Village arrived in mid to late August, and they had lots of fresh bison meat, they had lots of corn. Um, among their, the kinds of squashes they had were like pumpkins, so they had pumpkins, so they had lots of good food to eat during this time. Uh, during the winter, some of them might stay in Blue Earth Village, but during the winter they tended to break into smaller groups and they would oftentimes move back towards the east into northeastern Kansas. As you know, it was a little more wooded and this was a great place to find shelter in the winter. Uh, they would build, they would not use earth lodges at that time, they would build um, just kind of wiki ups or uh, pole structures covered with mats and hides. And they might move several times, they might be in small family groups. This was a time when they did a lot of hunting of deer. Deer were really important, almost as important as bison, although you don't hear about that as much. Uh, and they were also trapping fur bearing animals. By the time the Kanza were living at Blue Earth Village, they had been involved in the fur trade with European and then Euro-American traders for over a century. So we have to remember that when we see what their living was like in Blue Earth Village, that that was very different than people even, you know, much earlier than them or even a, a hundred years earlier than them that were not involved in the fur trade. So Blue Earth Village, for instance, when we look at the materials that are present at Blue Earth Village, we see that they are primarily a lot of things that are trade goods. By this time, they'd already abandoned making uh, ceramic pots and making stone tools. They've replaced those with metal objects. Yes. Yeah, we've got three questions Great. on the chat uh, that might be a good place to put them. Um, from Alice, she asked, how did they protect their crops from being eaten by wildlife if nobody stayed at the village? And, yeah, okay. And then there was a, a follow-up to that from Anna. She, she asked, to add to that, did some villagers stay behind to tend the crops? Yeah, those are really good questions. And uh, it looks like the entire village went and nobody stayed with their crops. So I don't know about you, if you ever try to grow your garden, you know, whether it be raccoons or deer or rabbits, it's hard to imagine having anything left if you didn't have them protected. Unfortunately, we don't have any records that tell us whether they protected them. However, when we look at analogies for other groups, there were very few protective measures that most village farmers that went off bison hunting did. 
Um, so they probably simply expected that, you know, plant two or three times more than you expect to get. And they always were using wild plants too. So I think these, even though it was corn, beans, squash, those things were really important to them. Um, they also had other foods to fall back on. So they were not solely dependent on them. For all I know, maybe the deer, the raccoons and stuff, maybe they kept them just enough in control and had enough other things that they weren't eating their crops. But really good question. We've all wondered about that. There was a, a third question. Uh, Richard asked, what are the mats made of? Yeah, so the mats, we don't know exactly what plants the Kanza used, but um, usually sedges and uh, maybe cattail rushes um, that they were weaving uh, very simple mats, but there were large numbers of these because the mats would oftentimes be used to cover the floors of the lodges. Uh, so you didn't have to be right on the dirt floor. And then their temporary lodges were usually covered with mats, although they might be covered with hides or with bark also. Uh, but when they moved, they were probably rolling up these mats and carrying those with them and then making new ones repeatedly out of the grasses, the sedges, the cattails, the rushes. Yeah. Okay. Right. Thanks. All right. Yeah, great questions. And you, so I hope you get a sense that, you know, the Kanza have these major villages or had a major village all at one time where they all felt one, part of one tribal entity. Um, but they had other activities that took them throughout eastern Kansas. So they were moving around a lot. Uh, in the winter was also the time when, winter and spring was the time when they were visiting the fur traders. So the deer hides uh, that they, they used some of those, but most of their trade was in deer hides. Now the traders really preferred beaver pelts, uh, but those were not as numerous. Uh, the second most numerous um, thing that they traded with the traders, Euro-American traders though, was otter skins or otter pelts. Uh, so it was through the trade of those goods that, or those pelts and skins, that they would get uh, muskets, um, the flints for those, the gunpowder for those, um, kettles, pots, uh, cloth. Uh, they still made a lot of their own clothing, but they did use cloth also. Lots of ornaments, whether that be uh, ear bobs or glass beads. Uh, all these things that had replaced a lot of their tr more traditional uh, objects that they made for themselves. It was much easier to simply trade for them and things that they really appreciated. So that trading was done then also in the winter and in the spring, they would stock up and then return back to their villages. Uh, most of the fur traders were located along the Kansas or along the Missouri River. And so that was where they usually went for their trading. But a lot of the traders would send uh, someone to live with them during the winter to make sure that they would get their furs because there was a lot of competition between the traders and they didn't want to be outcompeted. Now, I mentioned that the Kansa were um, very mobile and that is a tradition that they carried from much earlier. And Part of that is that that mobility was in this part of the world, but they also were migrants to this area. The Kansa really only trace can trace their um, their history in this general region back about 350 years. As you can see on the map here, it appears that they came further from the east originally. Well, how do we know that? Well, this is where we have to rely on oral traditions. And unfortunately, the Kanza experienced huge depopulation uh, pretty much in the decades after they were living at Blue Earth Village uh, because of smallpox um, and other diseases, um, lots of displacement by settlers after they had left Blue Earth Village. And that means that a lot of their oral traditions did not get recorded and were lost as elderly people passed away with those knowledge of their early history. However, the Kansa are related to several other groups. The Kansa are related to the Osage, the Quapaw, the Omaha, and the Ponca. They all speak a Siouan language 
uh, variants of a Siouan language called Digian lang Siouan languages. And they all have some similarity of their um, origin stories. And they all talk about having come from an area further to the east. Now, that was probably not just one location, but it could have ranged anywhere from uh, the Great Lakes, the Southern Great Lakes from Chicago over to Ohio, uh, we probably included Illinois, Indiana. We probably had a series of a number of different groups that eventually came together and their oral traditions tell us that they moved eastward, probably following the Ohio River down to its confluence with the Mississippi. Once they arrived as a single group there, um, they split or part of them split. One group split off and moved down the Mississippi River. And that is the, those are the ancestors of the Quapaw. The others from the mouth of the Mississippi went up the Mississippi River to the mouth of the Missouri River and then ascended the Missouri River. Another group, a large group split off when they got to the mouth of the Osage River and moved up that river. Not surprisingly, those are the ancestors of the Osage. And the Osage continued to live along the Osage River and its upper tributaries into those historic times. And so they were close to the Kanza. As the others continued to move up the Missouri River, the Kanza decided to settle along the Missouri River in what is now Northwestern Missouri and Northeastern Kansas. The others continued on up the Missouri River and became the Omaha and the Ponca. We don't know exactly when that migration occurred. However, it definitely occurred before 1724. And I would say probably more likely um, sometime in the 1600s. We know of two villages, one in, near St. Joe, Missouri, and the other across the river in Kansas. Both of those villages we have no historical record for, but archaeologically we believe that those are the earliest kinds of villages in this area. Yes, question. Okay. So, oh, we've got the questions are coming. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> so, so going back just a little ways, um, Anna wants to know if there are any accounts of the Kanza coming from the fur traders like did the fur traders have any stories the ones who stayed with them to get the pelts uh, who overwintered with them are there any accounts from them unfortunately there are not uh, most of the fur traders were illiterate and did not record uh, any of the things that they learned from them which is really unfortunate because a lot of those fur traders actually moved married into the tribes that was the way you built an alliance so that you could you know have that good relationship with a fur trader. Um, but either they were there only shortly, uh, temporarily. Um, I am looking at, and other people have also, we're looking at lots of fur trade records, um, but they come from the main posts or from the administrators who aren't out actually in the villages. So we get little tidbits now and then, but uh, unfortunately not enough details that come from those. Then Alice was wondering, what are the theories about what drove the westward movements? Yeah, that's another really good question. Uh, we think it's probably kind of a down the line impact of the European settlement on the East Coast. Uh, as Europeans settled along the East Coast in the 1500s, 1600s, they were pushing other pushing the eastern tribes further west slightly at a, you know, it's a slow process. Eventually it becomes, of course, purposeful, but it's this kind of slow movement. And it may not have been uh, directly that the Kanza were moving away from Europeans. In fact, that they probably had no contact with them, but they feel the pressure of others moving into their territories. And so that may be part of it. Um, it may have also been simply you know, kind of where can we expand that we know there are good things and they knew uh, down the line about, you know, bison further to the west. And so there may have been kind of a pull to come into that area too. And then Megan was asking, uh, with the splitting of the groups, were there con uh, was this conflict 
conflict driven or opportunity driven? What what prompted the splits of the group? Yeah, and again, unfortunately, our, our oral traditions don't tell us why they split, but they did maintain, they continued to maintain good relations with one another. Now, occasionally, there might be some arguments, but it, it, it appears that it was probably, you know, this large group, maybe some groups have minor antagonisms with others, but they also saw opportunity to move elsewhere. And so I'm sure, for instance, the Osage, you know, they saw, well, let's go up this major river where others were like, oh, we can continue up this, the Missouri River. This looks like a good river. So I think it's, we don't have any really clear evidence that there was antagonisms there. Um, although we do know from ethnographic analogy, just small antagonisms, one person, you know, one family not getting along with another, that can cause uh, fissioning right there. So it may be a combination of those. So this is my question. Um, weren't there already people there? Yeah, so that's a really good question. I don't know. I was hoping I might get to that later, and I may not. But um, they're actually in this area. I mean, there were indigenous peoples in the Great Plains. And so, you know, what happened to them? Well, there were certain areas that were kind of frontier zones that had developed just prior to the kinds of coming out here that left these areas, I don't want to say vacant, but they were hunting areas. They weren't where people were actually living. So when the Kansas start coming into this area, there were the Pawnee who would be in central Nebraska, even in very north central Kansas. And then there were Wichita who were down in very southeastern Kansas and actually about the same time moving into moving a little further south. Both of those groups, the ancestral Pawnee and the ancestral Wichita, were hunting in this area between them, but it was kind of a frontier area. And I think that's really what left it open for groups like the Kanza and the Osage to move into these areas. And Richard asked, does the current degree of language diversification support dates of likely population splits? Um, yes, um, and I'm trying to remember off the top of my head how much work has been done with these. Um, and I don't think a lot of dating has been done with the language splits. I, I actually have to say, I, I, I know there's been some work with that, but I, it's not like major studies that come to my mind. Um, there has been a, a fair amount of study done with the Kanza language, uh, well, with all the Degean languages. Uh, unfortunately, there are no native speakers of the Kanza language anymore. Uh, however, Bob Rankin in the 1970s, a linguist at KU, did record their language. And so they, they do still teach parts of their language to their children, uh, but there's very few people who actually can speak the language. Uh, there are some who have learned and, and definitely do. Um, they're similar with Osage, um, Omaha, Ponca, and they are divergent enough from one another that they're not identical to each other, but they can be understood uh, by the different groups, uh, which suggests a fairly recent um, divergence, which seems to fit with um, uh, these splits that we're suggesting. We're still looking for archaeological evidence that can help with that. Um, but so far, that hasn't succeeded in helping us date a whole lot. And then one last question from Anna. She wonders if the fur traders were non-Europeans. Um, all of the, the fur traders that were in this area were European initially. However, most of them, not most, well, many of them married into their tribes. And then their offspring oftentimes became fur traders. So we have a Métis or mixed blood group of people. Um, in fact, I find it really hard to call the traders other than the very first trader that makes, uh, that actually visited a Kansas village and recorded his visit there in 1724, Etienne de Bourgmont. He was truly French. Uh, many of the traders that came after him have French names, uh, but they were descendants 
of those first fur traders and oftentimes also of the native peoples themselves. Okay, we're caught up. Okay, great, excellent questions. Um, so anyway, we, we do have the Kanza in this area by the late 1600s or along the Missouri River by the late 1600s. I just mentioned Etienne de Bourgmont visited a village uh, in 1724 and I'll bring up my other map. That is the Kanza village of 1724 that was located uh, just below the mouth of Independence Creek and, uh, on the Missouri River. That village unfortunately has either washed away or has been built over. There's a small uh, historic town called Donovan there. Um, that is the first time we have direct report of someone report, reporting on the Kanza in their village. So Etienne Borgmont describes his visit, doesn't give a lot of detail about the villages, but he does describe how that they didn't just stay at their villages, that the entire village packed up for that summer bison hunt because he actually traveled with them. They packed up and they went to the Southwest and he went with them because he wanted to make contact with the Paducah, who are the Plains Apache, who would have been farther to the west. And they did meet up with one another in probably central Kansas. So we, we know that this is where we know that the entire village packed up to go on these uh, bison hunts, and that that goes back to 1724 and probably um, several decades earlier than that. My second map, you can see several other villages. Um, I won't go into all the details, but they basically were at the Kanza village of 1724, the Donovan site. They continued to live along the Missouri River through much of the 18th century, probably spending much of the middle part of the 1700s near Fort Cavignon, which was a French trading post, a very long lived one for 20 years. That's a long lived one. And so this is where the Kanza really underwent major change. They'd made change just to move out into um, the edge of the plains. But is while they were living near Fort Cavignon, they would have had direct access to those material goods that replaced their traditional ceramics and their traditional stone tools. That really happened very rapidly in this time when in the mid 1700s. Eventually, they, so we know we don't know all the villages they occupied, but they were in this area and then eventually moving out to Blue Earth Village. I suspect that they moved out to the Blue Earth Village to get away from the fur traders, but still be close enough. And the reason I say that is the trade posts were places where there was a lot, all kinds of different groups were drawn there. And sometimes these were the enemies of the Kanza. So the Sac, the Fox, the Iowa, these were groups that lived further to the east, but as the fur traders became more established with the Missouri River, they moved to, or they would come to the Missouri River very often. And so it was a volatile place to be near those posts. So I su suspect that the Kanza after a while said, you know, if we can live a little further away, it'll be a little more peaceful. Plus it put them a little bit closer to their bison hunting grounds. They continued to live at Blue Earth Village until about 1828. In 1825, the Kanza signed, uh, it was the second treaty they signed with the US government. The first treaty was simply a peace treaty. The second treaty gave, basically gave up most of their lands and established the first Kanza reservation. And I didn't have my map real handy, and I, so I didn't get that in there, but the, basically the Kanza re reservation was a strip of land that ran east-west, 30 miles wide, uh, from basically where Topeka is today uh, to the west, and it did include the Blue Earth Village. However, there was a lot of um, disagreement within the tribe about whether that treaty should have been signed. And so um, the leaders, uh, new leaders developed, and there was factionalism in the tribe, and the tribe split into three major villages uh, and, and they moved downstream to be closer to the federal agents and establish Fool Chiefs Village, Hard Chiefs Village and American Chiefs Village. Uh, 
uh, there is yet another, I wouldn't necessarily call it a village, but another possible settlement around, around uh, another Kanza leader called White Plume that was closer uh, or a little further to the east. Uh, these villages, uh, while living here, the Kanza ex were exposed to much more in the way of disease, uh, interaction, not just with traders, but travelers on immigrant trails, for instance, going through this area. And this was a very difficult time. They're there from about 1828 to about 1844. And some of you might be aware that in 1844, the Kansas River had a major flood. That adversely impacted Fulchis Village. Hard Cheese Village is on a higher point, was not as drastically hit or American Cheese Village. But it was very difficult for the tribe given all the things that were going on. So by 1846, they moved to their second reservation, which was down in the upper reaches of the Neosho River. This is an area they oftentimes went hunting in, so they were familiar with it. And they reestablished three villages in this area. Uh, this would have been near Council Grove. Uh, this is also during the period in which the um, Santa Fe Trail is really becoming popular. That also meant that much more disease, uh, whiskey or alcohol, um, depredations by people moving through the Euro-Americans moving through the area. So again, the Kanza experienced a very, very difficult time while living on the upper Neosho River. If you would like to learn about that, I'd really strongly recommend you read the book by Ron Parks called The Darkest Period. Uh, their population Remember the Blue Earth Village may have been 1,200 to up to maybe 1,900 people. Um, in this period along the upper Neosho, they dropped down to just several hundred people. So this is where a lot of um, oral traditions were lost and uh, you know, all kinds of other parts of their traditional culture were lost. Uh, eventually, in 1873, they decided to move yet again, and they established a new reservation. They actually used federal monies to purchase lands from the Osage, who had a reservation in northern Oklahoma. And in 1873, they moved to north, northeastern Oklahoma, and this is where their tri tribal headquarters uh, still exist today. So as you can see, the Kansa actually were in this part of Kansas for a relatively short period of time, but a very important period of their time. And so this really is the heartland of their um, culture, even today, even though they, most of them live in a variety of cities and places all over the world today. Okay. Well, I see that I'm uh, coming up on probably where I need to stop. So I'm gonna just do one other thing which I could talk much longer on. And that is simply by uh, introducing you to the depth of time of the other indigenous peoples that existed here in Kansas, or what we now call Kansas before the Ka, because as we mentioned, they're relatively recent migrants. Um, so to learn about the earlier peoples, we have no historic record for the earlier peoples. And in fact, we don't have oral traditions that take us back further in time, or at least not reliable ones. And so we have to rely solely on archeological evidence, which means I can't tell you exactly who the identities of these people are, but I can give you a sense of how far back in time um, people have been in this area. And so I simply put up a timeline and you can see archeologists talk in terms of arbitrarily named periods. And if you look at this timeline, you see that the early historic period far off on the right, this is where we have the Kanza, the Pawnee, the Osage, the Apache, the Plains Apache, and then further to the South, the Wichita. And they're just on the very end of a very long time line. Uh, we now know from archaeological studies in various parts of North America that the earliest peoples in North America arrived 
uh, probably about 16,000 years ago. We do not have an archeological record that it stretches that far back in Kansas. But we do know that there were people in this area as early as about 13,500 years ago. And if you think about the timing of that, that was at the very end of the Pleistocene. So those were people who were moving through a new landscape, escape, exploring, exploring new landscapes, establishing homes, but it was just a time of a lot of change, of environmental change. So they're adjusting to the grasslands, uh, the change from the megafauna, the Pleistocene megafauna to a more modern uh, a fauna, for instance, in plants. That's what we refer to as the Paleo-Indian period, that period of adaptation. Um, but it's a time in which the whole continent is populated and people, uh, different groups become established in different areas. And for thousands of years through that Paleo-Indian into through the archaic period, people are living off of wild resources and they're tending to stay within, establish themselves in one particular area. For instance, a portion of the Northern Flint Hills and their families stay there for generation upon generation upon generation upon generation because they have the knowledge of that area and the resources that are available to them there, which seasons are available, where to travel to at which season. So it's not an aimless wandering. They have very purposeful knowledge of the landscape. Um, by about 2000 years ago, they add to that hunting and gathering um, plants that they had once that they had they had been collecting in wild form, they start to domesticate some of those plants. So about 2000 years ago, we see the domestication of squashes, we see the domestication of sunflowers, marsh elder or Iva anua, uh, goosefoot, kinopodium, um, little barley. They use these then during what's called the woodland period. Remember, that's just an arbitrary name. It doesn't mean there were more woodlands here, but they're using those native domesticates to supplement their wild foods. It is not until about a thousand years ago that people settle down in this area as farmers, but still using wild resources they're raising those native domesticates at established farmsteads that they live at year round. And that's during the late prehistoric period. Um, what we see in this area is that they are individual families living in scattered farmsteads. In addition to those native domesticates, they now have added corn, which was introduced into this area, corn and beans. And these sedentary farmers are scattered up and down stream valleys throughout the Central Plains. So for instance, there are a number of these sites that have been recorded over the years, for instance, along Wildcat Creek. And individual houses or farmsteads, one or two families living together, and then maybe another half a mile away, another one or two of those. And eventually, probably around AD 1350, there is another group, and I won't get into details here. There's another group that comes from the east into an area to the north of here. And that changes the whole cultural dynamic of the Central Plains. And it causes these small farmsteads to, of people to band together and move to areas, centralized areas, where they do establish the very first villages. And that's during our proto-historic period. And that's when we get the Pawnee, for instance, developing in uh, Nebraska, and then in central to southeastern Kansas, where we get the Wichita. Those are both Cadoan speaking groups, northern Cadoan speaking groups, who changed their life ways well, yet again. They continued to be farmers raising lots of corn, but they, it was what we call a dual economy, uh, like what we talked about for the Kanza. They're raising um, corn and other crops part of the year, but they're also traveling out into the plains and hunting bison in large numbers. And that's actually the first time we see these huge, large communal bison hunts. It's happening before they have the horse though. Um, but it was not a common practice of 
earlier peoples, uh, not the late prehistoric farmers, for instance. Occasionally they'd hunt a bison, but not in large numbers. Um, so getting back to the question Jill had earlier, once we get these small farmsteads and they then, after this other group moves in, which I'll just refer to as Oneota, which was probably a little more aggressive, these individual farmsteads start to band together. And that's where we see the centralized location of population to the north of the Pawnee and the Wichita to the south. And that means that this area right around Manhattan, for instance, and even over to basically along the Kansas River is between those two areas. It looks like an open area for the Kanza to move in. Okay, and so with that, I'll, I'll stop. <laughs> I, I've, got, I've got two questions for you. Um, Oh, excellent. Uh, one, so the arrowheads that we found at Kanza, we found, I don't know, four or five of them. Those are obviously pre caw Right. Yeah, and I, I, right off the top of my head, I don't remember exactly what they look like, but uh, I believe that I seem to remember at least one of them was a fairly small uh, arrow point. That was probably associated with the late prehistoric period. And so probably some of these local scattered farmsteads. I don't know of a scattered farm, one of those farmsteads along King Creek, but there could have been. There were definitely the some along the Kansas River, um, maybe like along McDowell Creek, for instance. So they could have been people farming uh, in that area and going out and hunting. And then I know at least one of the other artifacts that's been found out there was probably dates much earlier to the very early archaic or late Paleo-Indian period. So I think we probably have a span, even at the Kanza, of that entire time period. That's fascinating. Um, two other questions. Kelly asked, do we know of any indigenous settlements on what is present day Fort Riley? Uh, yes. Uh, first of all, there's a lot of archaeological um, remains out there. In fact, we have a crew of three archaeologists who are employed solely to look after the archaeology at Fort Riley. Also tells you where the government money <laughs> is. Um, but as far as specific villages, actually the Kanza did have a village right where the old heart of Fort Riley is today, uh, which unfortunately has destroyed the village. But, you know, I talk about Blue Earth Village was occupied between 1790 and 1828. But for some reason, I don't know why, sometimes the Kanza decided to not plant their crops at Blue Earth. And in 1811, a man by the name of George Sibley went out to visit the Kanza and he did not find them at Blue Earth Village. He found them at a temporary billet village, but they were planting their crops at Fort Riley, where Fort Riley is today. So for whatever reason, maybe their lodges were full of lice that year and they just decided to <laughs> go elsewhere for that year. Okay, that's it. The, the, the viewers love this. I think it's fascinating. I have a quick question. Just one more question, Jill, if I may. Um, so, I know that uh, the Mongolians, for instance, have a tradition of facing their, their gears south, the doors of their gears south. I was just yep. wondering if, if there's any cultural tradition of you know, directionality there. I noticed that in that original drawing, the doors were all facing the same direction. So that might help figure out what the backdrop was. Right, um, so we do know that some groups did you know, face in particular areas, usually for spiritual reasons. Unfortunately for the Ka, we don't have any indication of that. And it's hard to test that. So that is the only illustration we have of the village. It's actually the very first illustration of any Earth Lodge village. You know, there was other groups that built Earth Lodges too, and Earth Lodge village. This is the very first one ever to, for someone to make. Um, and they look like they're facing the same direction, but they may be facing towards the center of the village, for instance. Uh, because so much of Blue Earth Village has been destroyed, not a lot of archaeological work has been done there. 
Uh, one lodge was excavated back in the 1930s before a lot of the village was, ex was destroyed. Our general impression from what little evidence we have um, probably are not orienting their uh, lodges in a particular direction for the Kanza. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Excellent. And and we have had a request for uh, the information on your last slide. If you could, if you just want to repost it for a second, I'll take a screenshot yes. and then I'll send that to the to the list. I will do that. There you go. And I'd be happy to send that out. That's just a, a kind of an abbreviated list but I think the things that would be most useful for someone you know who might want to just delve a little bit into it without getting into all the heavy duty archaeology and things. And we might want to say here that there is a wonderful uh, display at the Flint Hills Discovery Center along with uh, quite a bit of interpretive and um, worksheets available for students there that you participated in the development of that. Yes and uh, it so we helped develop the exhibit, um, lots of information there. Um, but the, and if any of you work with school groups, for instance, they do have, uh, we developed an educational program that with CARES money, they have now made virtual uh, that looks specifically at the archeological evidence for one of those late prehistoric uh, farmsteads, or one of their lodges that was excavated right here in well, actually a lodge in North Central Kansas, but very comparable to ones that have been excavated right here in Manhattan. Uh, so it's a great activity where students actually get to look at the archeological evidence and look at not just pictures of the artifacts, but at what is the archeological evidence for the lodge and how is the artifacts distributed and they get to practice their critical thinking. And uh, you can contact Stephen Bridenstine at the Flint Hills Discovery Center for that program. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Lauren. My pleasure. I uh, hope everybody stays warm and safe out there. And I hope that it helps expand your background at least a little bit. It's wonderful. Thank, Thank you so you. much.